Uh, well, uh, it's funny that Leanne says that I'm real, because I'm probably going to argue tonight that I'm not real. Um, and I just wanted to say, I got so worried about copyright laws that I had my kids make some of the artwork for tonight. Um, <laughs> so I hope they don't sue me. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the confabulous brain tonight. My son Caden did a fantastic coloring job on his brain here. And I'm going to start with seemingly a simple question, uh, but I think we'll see that's actually a very complex question as we go through today. How do you know that you are here? How do you know that you're in this room, that you're next to these people on this night? How do you know who you are? I mean, I can ask the same question to myself. How do I know that my name is Matt Collins? How do I know that I'm a professor at this school? How do I know that I'm married? How do I know that I like Doritos? It seems like a simple question, but it's actually quite complex. And what it comes down to, a question of what is actually real. Now, philosophically, reality is defined as the state of things as they actually exist. Not as they're imagined, not as they appear in your thoughts, but as they exist in the physical world. And this is actually a really deep question that has been explored in one of my favorite movies. And I take any chance I can to talk about The Matrix. So if you haven't seen it, I'll give you a brief synopsis. In the movie, Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, a wonderful Canadian, is getting these cryptic messages on his computer monitor who he believes are from this man named Morpheus. Neo eventually finds Morpheus, and he finds out very disturbing things about what he thought reality actually was. What Morpheus tells him is the state of reality, as human beings experience it, is not what we think it is. In physical reality, what human beings are are simple batteries for this malevolent race of sentient machines. That's all we are. But what we experience in our reality is simply sensory experience fed to the brain, a neural interactive stimulation, a dream world. That's all it is. And you might say to yourself, well, what a fantastic Hollywood movie. But what the filmmakers are actually exploring in this movie is actually a really deep philosophical question. One that a number of philosophers have attempted to explore themselves. So we can take someone like Rene Descartes, who asked, what is real and what is an illusion? Now Descartes reached this interesting conclusion. He said, when I dream, what I see, what I feel, feels real to me. And if that's the case, how can I ever trust my senses to tell me what is real about the world. If I can't tell when I'm dreaming, and if I can't tell when I'm awake, what is real? Right? And it's the exact same thing that they're exploring in the Matrix. Right? When Neo comes to realize that the world he experiences is not truly as it is, that he is just a hu another human being living in a pod for his entire life, being farmed for his energy, he can't trust his senses anymore. And this is the same conclusion that Descartes comes to. Now, Descartes comes to an interesting conclusion after this. He says, if I can't trust my senses to tell me what is real, what is fiction, what is fantasy, what is truth, the only thing that I can trust is my mind. Because when you come to this conclusion that perception is unreliable, you have nowhere else to look for knowledge except for your mind. And this is what Descartes comes to do. And this is where he says, well, the only thing I can really know is I think, therefore I am cognito ergo sum. And it's the exact same thing that happens in the matrix. Neo comes to realize that the difference between the matrix, this neural interactive dream world that he thought was reality, and what actual physical reality is, that human beings are just pods being farmed to their energy, he comes to realize that the only thing he can trust as well is in his mind. And in fact, when he asks Morpheus about what is real, when he first realizes that the world isn't as he thought it to be, Morpheus poses this really interesting question. Well, what is real? How do you define what is real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste, and what you can see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. But this in itself is another statement. 
is this actually the case? Can you trust your brain to tell you reality from fantasy, truth from fiction? So let's shift perspective on this question a little bit. Let me ask you a question I know you can't answer. Who is Mrs. B? And let me tell you how we can answer this question in two different ways. If you ask Mrs. B who she is, she will say, I'm almost 50 years old. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm currently in the hospital because I've suffered a ruptured blood vessel in my left leg. This evening when I get out of the hospital, I will be holding a reception in my home. And just that morning in the hospital, she had been visited by her mother and her brother. This is what Mrs. B will tell you. In the real world, at least as the rest of us see us, Mrs. B is actually 63 years old. She recently suffered, three months ago, from a ruptured aneurysm in her brain, which destroyed parts of her basal forebrain and her prefrontal cortex. And she now suffers from severe amnesia. Mrs. B will not be holding a reception in her home this evening because she can't leave the hospital. Mrs. B was not visited in the hospital this morning by her mother and brother because they had died 13 and 15 years ago, respectively. Mrs. B had nothing wrong with her left leg, though in her past, about 19 years ago, she had had several operations on her leg. So what's going on here? Is Mrs. B lying? Are her pants on fire? <laughs> She's not. She believes every single word that she says. She's put together this mix of details from her life into a true story of what she thinks her life is. And in fact, what Mrs. B is doing is she's confabulating. Mrs. B suffers from something called confabulation syndrome with amnesia. Confabulation syndrome is when an individual will take true events from their life, put them together into mix, into a story that is not true at all. The best description I've ever seen of it is, is called honest lying because there is absolutely no intent to deceive whatsoever. Mrs. B believes every single word that she's telling you. Mrs. B is not being malevolent. She's telling the truth as she sees it. Now, this type of syndrome is very rare, but it's very different than the typical amnesia that we think about. An individual's that have this type of syndrome typically suffer from damage to areas of the prefrontal cortex. And it can be associated with, as Mrs. B was, with a ruptured blood vessel that cuts off the brain flow to that part of the brain, and you have damage to the medial prefrontal cortex and the orbital frontal cortex, this red area up here. Now, this is very different than another type of amnesia that individuals typically suffer, where damage occurs in and around the hippocampus, which is the green area up here. Individuals that suffer from damage in and around the hippocampus do not confabulate. However, people like Mrs. B that suffer from damage to the areas of the prefrontal cortex and the orbital frontal cortex consistently confabulate more than individuals with the normal type of amnesia. So what's going on? Now, one thing we have to separate out here, how is this different than false memory? Right? Earlier this semester, we had Dr. Loftus come talk to us. Right? False memory is belief in an event that never happened. Right? It's confusing details between events, such that you create a false memory. And often, false memory is explained as a source confusion. And an individual will perfectly remember details of an event, but will confuse the actual source of that memory. There's a great example of this recently. I always like to use relevant examples. Right? Here is our, one of our presidential candidates for the Republican Party, Mitt Romney. And recently he was speaking in Detroit to a rally. And he is talking about the Golden Jubilee, which was the 50th anniversary of the automobile in America. And he's talking passionately about how he remembers the streets of, gold, of Detroit were painted gold. How he passionately remembers that this was in one of the last public appearances of Henry Ford. How his father was the Grand Marshal of the Golden Jubilee. The problem is, is the Golden Jubilee took place on June 1st, 1949, nine months before Mitt Romney was born. 
Is Mitt Romney lying? No. Mitt Romney is, you know, take the classic term, he's misremembering. A great example of false memory. He's not a time traveler. He wasn't there. But at the foot of his father, I'm sure he heard many tales about this event. And it came to be one of his own memory. Now, if we're going to talk about any kind of similarities or any kind of difference between confabulation syndrome and false memory, of course we'd have to actually see some brain differences when it came to true and false memory. If we look at typically the seat of memory in the brain, typically it's the hippocampus, probably not the source of memories. In fact, I know it's not the source of memory, but it does play a role in memories. If we try to look at differences between true and false memories, we see no differences in activity at all in the hippocampus. But if we look in areas of the prefrontal cortex, the orbital frontal cortex, guess what? There are activity differences between true and false memory more activity for false events, false memories, than there is for true memories. It's interesting. So what's going on? Is this a part of our brain that is telling us what is true, what is false? The experience we have of remembering is a very important experience. But of course, conversely, the experience we have of not remembering is also very important. When we experience that vague, inconsistent, mm, a little bit implausible memory, we're much less likely to say, hey, that actually happened to me. This is an important thing to think about. Is this the area of the brain that's involved in generating that message? Well, the problem is, is every day you do fine telling the difference between fantasy and reality. You watch TV, you read books, you watch movies. Anyone ever here confuse themselves as being in the matrix? And ever here confuse the difference between their life in a book versus their life in reality? I hope not. So what's going on? Do we have some kind of area in the brain that tells us what is real, what is not real? What is fantasy, what is reality? Well, let me tell you about a really interesting study. In the study, what they had people do is they had people judge one-sentence scenarios. And they're asked to judge these sentences, whether they're possible or impossible. And in the scenarios, they're asked to think about a real person, like a friend or a relative. And then they're asked to think about this real person interacting with one of three types of people. In one situation, they're going to interact with a fictional character like Cinderella up here. I hope we know Cinderella doesn't exist, right? We are in Florida. It's not real when you see her at Disney World. So they're thinking about this real person interacting with this fictional character. In a second situation, you're going to think about this real person, a friend or a relative, interacting with a real person, but a real person that's famous, like George Bush. In the third scenario, you're going to think about this real person, this friend or relative, interacting with another real person, another friend or relative. So here is the friend of the subject interacting with the subject's mother. And these interactions occur in two different contexts. One is an interactive context, such as someone spoke to George Bush or the name of the friend yesterday, and you're asked to judge, is this possible or impossible? In the other situation, it's an imaginative context, where someone dreamt about George Bush or the friend yesterday. And same thing for the fictional character. But of course, in the fictional character case, it's impossible, I hope. And what they're looking for is they're looking for MRI differences between these three situations. The fictional character, the real famous, and the real person that they know. And we see some really nice differences. Areas of the prefrontal cortex, the orbital frontal cortex, are more strongly engaged when they're asked to make judgments about real people that they know. Areas of the prefrontal cortex, the orbital frontal cortex, are engaged at a medium level for a real person that's famous. And of course, we see the lowest level of engagement for that fictional character, Cinderella. So what's going on? Well, a lot of these areas in the brain, the prefrontal cortex, 
are actually involved in retrieving episodic memory. They're involved in self-referential processing. How closely a stimuli is related to you. Could it be that these areas are becoming active with more details, stronger associative context to tell you whether someone is real or someone is not real? Are they becoming more active to give you the details about the difference between truth and fiction, fantasy and reality? Now, this is an interesting thing to think about because here we've explored one area of the brain. It's destroyed in confabulation syndrome, and guess what? People confabulate. We see differences in this area of the brain between true and false memories. We see activity in this brain, in this part of the brain, that depends on whether you're processing information about a real person that you know, a real person that's famous, or a completely fictional character. Is this the area of the brain that's allowing to, us to tell fantasy from reality? If it is, then Morpheus might have been wrong. Because in fact, the activity in your brain is failing you. Those people with confabulation syndrome are failing from the activity in their brain. Those same electrical signals that tell you what's truth, what's fiction, aren't telling you what's truth and fiction. They'll tell you what's truth, they'll tell you what's fiction. Fantasy and reality is in the same place in the brain. So this is an interesting thing to think about. And so many philosophers through the years, and it's been a especially popular topic in postmodernist philosophy, people like Descartes, people like Leibniz, people like George Berkeley, have studied this question for so long. And yet, I think it's probably best summed up, this difference between fantasy and reality, if it's simply electrical signals, and we can't tell the difference, by my favorite postmodernist philosopher, George Costanza. When he said, it's not a lie if you believe it. Thank you.